Greetings, everyone. So I want you to think for a second, OK? I really need you to think about this. And I want you to count in your head the number of people that you might pass by on a given day. So that means like in your commute, here at TEDx Jersey City, for example, right? At your job, on uh, the streets of Jersey City, wherever you happen to be in a typical day, how many people do you think you are passing by, right? Think about it. And when you have an idea, raise your hand. Elliot, how many people do you think you're passing by on a given day? Ten people a day? I am highly impressed with you, sir. That is fewer than I think anyone has ever said in my life, right? <laughs> anyone else? What do you think? About a thousand, right? If you happen to be on the subway, if you happen to be at an event, right? We have a thousand people that were passing by in a given day. And now think about how many of those thousand people you have a real, honest-to-goodness connection with, conversation, right? Maybe two, three, if you're lucky, five, right? We can count it on one hand. So of the hundreds to thousands, or in Elliot's case, 10 people that you are passing by in a given day, right? We actually engage with the number of people that fit on one hand. This discrepancy is really concerning to me, right? How does it affect us as a community to be surrounded by hundreds of people with whom we feel barred from connecting? According to a group of um, Duke University researchers, 25% of all Americans have no one in whom they confide, right? No one. And 44 million Americans, according to the American Association of Retired People, identify themselves as lonely. These are sobering statistics to me. So how do we manage this overstimulation of thousands of people and corresponding simultaneous sense of alienation? Well, I know how I manage it, like this. And like this. And like this, right? And that's how we are managing this situation. So my question has become, <laughs> the whiskey came up, didn't it? <laughs> In the face, guys, of this loneliness and overstimulation, what would happen if we felt more connected to the thousands of strangers around us? Disasters do this communities like Hurricane Sandy did for Jersey City, right? Holidays do it. We're entering the holiday season, and all of a sudden, everyone gets a little bit more chipper and pleasant with each other, right? If you have a good day, it happens. But I want to know if we could find a way to feel like we had within us the capacity to connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time. And we did. What would that do for us? So I come from a long line of chatters. It's not abundantly obvious. Um, my um, family is a big Irish Catholic family from Minnesota. So this translates to nice and chatty, right? Um, so we are those people that start up conversations with strangers in public restrooms. Awkward, but true, right? <laughs> we coax a person's life story out of us while at dentist office reception rooms. And we are the people who annoy you at the grocery store when you're just trying to get a carton of milk because we're commiserating with a cash register, cash register employee about the price of peanut butter or the situation with education these days, right? And as annoying I found this, as I found this tendency when my mother did it to me, right, when I was little, I have absolutely and undeniably become that person. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Now, I am an interactor. Which means, basically, I have spent my entire life and career trying to trick people into playing with me, right? I persuaded my extended family, yes, the chatty ones, um, to wear homemade construction paper pilgrim hats during our Thanksgiving dinner when I was six. I mean, who could say no to that adorable girl, right? And they didn't. As a math teacher, I tricked my 10th grade students into um, doing trigonometry by building and flying kites. 
And in Berlin, I cajoled the Germans into chats using my, in their terms, adorable German. Now, if you've ever tried to get a German to chat with you, it is not easy. <laughs> Now, on stage, I take every and all opportunities to break the fourth wall and get the audience to engage in their own storytelling. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have found the ultimate way to get strangers talking to each other and, of course, with me. Are you ready for this? Good, because it's happening. Haiku. Yes! Haiku, you guys know it. Well, let me clarify. They are three-lined, traditionally 17-syllabled, Japanese in origin pieces of poetry, right? Five, seven, five syllables, and that's it. We were all forced at one time in elementary school to write these things, and then we forgot them promptly and never used them again. Um, well, guess what? It's the great engager, and here's why. Haiku originated as a form of court poetry in ancient Japan that was like a community improv game, right? Someone would start with a haiku on a particular theme and the assembled group would riff off of it and they would go with haiku as long as they possibly could. So its beginnings were very playful and interactive. Moreover, the goal of haiku is to create a word picture that freezes this particular moment in time, right? You have to be in the moment to write it. It's short, right? It requires you to get to the essence immediately. For me, that's very hard. Um, but it's very important. And it's simple. And as with all simple things, you can communicate the necessaries quickly. Everyone can find their way in. But there are layers of complexity that each writer and reader brings to the table. So you choose your own adventure. It's very democratic. So I've always found haiku strangely compelling for these reasons. And I used haiku in bars and in public transportation and at parties. So I would write a line and then I would pass it off to somebody and not tell them what to do and see if they would figure it out, right? And all of a sudden, it would go wild. And we would have haiku happening all over the subway or the bar or the party. And it would be full of haikuists. And they're all counting syllables on their hands. So I saw this and I was like, how can I use this on a larger level to get entire communities checking in with themselves and talking to each other to change that ratio of people passed by to people connected with? So I started experimenting, as interactor game players do, in my head. <laughs> what if I thought you gave people buckets of sidewalk chalk, right? Um, you made a scavenger hunt and you had them head into different neighborhoods to cover that neighborhood with haiku, inspired by what they see and experience, and you get people to do it with them. I called this like not quite born thought, the guerrilla haiku movement, right? It sounds very fancy. And it lived in my one little mind and at dinner parties that started with, wouldn't it be cool if, and everyone always concurred, oh my God, it would be so cool if, right? And that's where it lived, as most thoughts do, right? In my head and at dinner parties, as many of all of our thoughts do. And then one day, three years ago, in November of 2010, I decided suddenly to take this idea out of my head and give it some life, right? So all my dinner party compadres that had in word told me it would be so cool if were invited. Right? 50 people were expected, and eight people showed up in Bryant Square Park. And so I was like, depressed, right? I sent out these two teams, and I was cold, and I was walking about midtown, and I was writing all of these very depressing haiku, right? Um, and then everyone came back afterwards to warm themselves and share their experiences. And this is what they showed me, Washington Square Park. Union Square, a host of haiku left behind, a lot of cold noses and excited stories and moments of connection. These eight people were hooked, and I was heartened. Something about this works, but will it work anywhere? And with people I don't know at all. 
Well, five months later, I modified my original idea. I visited family in San Francisco to implement this new iteration of Gorilla Haiku in a different city. Five teams of folks, mainly unknown to me, headed out into five neighborhoods, 30 San Franciscans. A 13-year-old girl saw my event on Yelp and convinced her mother that she needed to join us. A 10-year-old homeschooled boy and his mother were supposed to do a science lesson that day. They ditched it and joined us on the streets of San Francisco. Now, the 10-year-old boy and the 13-year-old girl were fearless in their pursuit of haikuists, right? They talked to policemen and people on dates and groups of roving teenagers. They were turned on by their success at connecting with the people they encountered. And when all five teams got back together again at the end, from a published haikuist slash web developer to a science educator to a performance artist, I knew I had created a monster. <laughs> Thus spawned this obsession that, begins to, that continues today. Two and a half years and 50 events later, the guerrilla haiku movement has been tested in over 30 different cities across the country. And something keeps happening. Madison, Wisconsin. Two young men, one was all clad in black and declared himself a poet, right, in the way that undergrads declare themselves poets. Um, the other, in a baseball cap, left his friends um, at the bar to hang out with us in the rain at a bus stop and called himself a scientist and said he'd never written a haiku before. Now, these two strangers eventually worked together on a haiku that was about the power of being in the present moment. And we left them at that bus stop, deep in the kinds of conversations that only happen on undergrad campuses, <laughs> right? A poet and a scientist, this totally unlikely pair, brought together by haiku. Man, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right? A mother with two preschool kids heard about the event on public radio. Um, and she came, professed to come, because her kids, she wanted to expose them to haiku. Now, these kids could barely write their letters. So I was like, lady, you've got something going on here, so I'm going to follow you. So I went with her to her neighborhood, which was this slightly affluent neighborhood in Milwaukee. So she went on a bathroom break with her kids. I checked out their clipboard. On their clipboard, 20 pre-written haiku, all about tolerance. This in Milwaukee, one of the most segregated cities in the nation. So she got back from the bathroom and I said, excuse me, why haven't we written any of these anywhere? And she was flustered and had no good response, so we started writing them everywhere, right? <laughs> now this was my favorite of hers, right? It says, abandon hatred's burden. Look into their eyes. A mom finds her voice and uses it. A testament to the teams of kids from Orange, New Jersey. Um, it's a youth arts organization that's affiliated with HANDS, an amazing nonprofit organization there. They went forth in their neighborhood to give residents this opportunity to reflect on their city. Groups of children left the basketball courts to keep writing. In the Ninth Ward, In New Orleans, groups of spring break volunteers and Ninth Ward residents came together to share their thoughts about this oh so important giving and receiving happening in those neighborhoods in 17 syllables. Sixth graders in the South Bronx made their way to Yankee Stadium, and after flagging down, I kid you not, a bus of Brazilian tourists for haiku adventures, they left behind this in this unassuming office doorway. Never stop writing. It can inspire people. Your words mean the world. From sixth graders. A group of English as a Second Language students at the new school in New York City leave their safe classrooms to walk the city streets. Fearful, at the least, of approaching New Yorkers with their not yet quite perfect English, they registered more than a little apprehension. They actually looked at me like, lady, you're crazy. Um, and their first communal haiku together was apropos to this feeling. They wrote this, nervous, excited, 
This is the first time to hear small human voices. And hear them they did. This group defied their own expectations and were wildly successful at persuading New Yorkers to join them in their haikuing, including chatting up this brass band. Amazing. The students in one team approached a man and asked him to write with them. He wanted to know why. And the students responded that they wanted to hear what he had to say. So he paused and he told them, I used to be a writer, but I stopped writing because nobody reads my words. And he picked up the chalk. This man left this behind. A man lived here once, but they took his dignity. Now he is nothing. Keep writing, stranger. We're listening. Here in our own city, of course, JC, I've done formal and informal haikuings with schools and arts organizations, poets and environmental activists. I mean, if you've exited Grove Street Path Station on a Friday, I have probably tried to cajole you into writing a haiku, right? I'm sorry, but I'm obsessed. It's just how it is. Now, one of my most profound moments in JC happened at last year's studio tour pub crawl. We ended at Made With Love Bakery, um, and passersby were writing, and two teenage boys on bikes were intrigued by the chalk and tagged their, mo their names on the pavement. And as one of them finished, I told him, I'm sorry, sir, you can't be finished because you haven't written a haiku yet. Um, well, he perked up. He's like, haiku? What is this? And his friends headed down the street and far away. So he and his brother stayed, Dean and Angel. They wrote their first haiku. I gave them a short bed cookie tribute, right? They were amazed by the deliciousness, and before they left with their paperbacks that they found randomly on a stoop, right? Um, I think they were some sort of science fiction novel, right? Dean commented to me, nobody talks to us like this. They always think we're up to no good. These two dear hearts man meandered back into Jersey City streets after their friends, fading into the evening. No matter where or with whom guerrilla haiku has happened, the result has been consistent. People say yes. They play with. And moments of connection inevitably occur. I cannot tell you why exactly or how. I'm working on it. But something magical happens, friends, in the offering of a piece of chalk the offering of a moment of play, the offering of an ear. Even if just for a moment, people, those teeming masses of people that we pass by every day, they open themselves to us. They become human. And we become human as well. So to you, TEDx Jersey City, I make this offering. Under all of your chairs is a card. My mother put them all there. So they are there. We shall call it for our purposes a haiku card. Use it. Write your 17 syllable ode in a moment that needs to be shared and share it with a stranger. And for that one moment of sharing, we are not hiding under our covers or in our iPhones or in our glasses of whatever it is we like to drink. For that moment, we just get to be together. To haiku.